Hello, I'm Mike from independencelive.net, otherwise known as Indie Live. I recently talked to well-known Scottish journalist and broadcaster Ian McWhirter. Ian is a political commentator for the Herald and Sunday Herald. He's also the author of the book Road to Referendum. Ian came to talk to us about his recent article on the Lord's ruling of a possible Scottish veto of Westminster's Brexit process and triggering of Article 50. In his article, he says... Scotland should thank their lordships for making crystal clear what many suspected, namely that the Sewell Convention is codswallop. It has no legal force. The clause in the 2016 Scotland Act, which supposedly placed Sewell on a statutory footing, was just there to fool the natives. Holyrood's legislative powers are clearly and explicitly on loan from Westminster and liable to be overridden as and when the UK government chooses. I asked Ian if he could say a bit more about his article. The Lords and the Supreme Court were investigating a specific question about Article 50 and whether or not uh, Parliament had to give its assent before the uh, motion could be put through that triggers our Brexit from the European Union. But they were also asked to consider whether or not uh, there should be a legislative consent motion from the Scottish Parliament. In other words, should Hollyer also have to give its say? And they said no, there's no grounds for that veto at all. Now, initially, I think a lot of people felt, well, a bit like, here's another parcel of rogues, you know, they're, they're trying to diminish the status of our parliament, um, you know, they're, they're, they're giving us a bit of a rough deal. But I think they actually did us a favour, because they made explicit what a lot of us have realised and suspected before now, that the whole Sewell Convention, under which Westminster supposedly does not legislate on areas of competence of the Scottish Parliament, without the Parliament's express agreement in a legislative consent motion, that that sole convention is basically window dressing. Now, you, it's called a convention, um, but conventions are quite important. I mean, there are lots of conventions. I mean, the fact that every act of Parliament is signed off by the Queen, that's a convention. You know, it's, uh, these conventions are not uh, uh, just uh, a mere form of words. And moreover, the Sewell Convention was supposedly placed on a statutory basis by the 2016 Scotland Act. This was part of the vow, part of the deal after the referendum was that the Scottish Parliament's powers would be entrenched and the Sewell Convention would no longer just be any old convention, but it would be placed on a statutory footing. And many people thought that meant that it was now a legal obligation, that, Scot that Hollywood had to give its assent whenever its powers were taken away or added to. But clearly, that's not the case. Uh, much was made of this before... Uh, the Scotland Act was passed in the debates in the Scotland Act. We were all told that this meant that the Scottish Parliament was entrenched. It had a, a, a solid constitutional foundation. In other words, that it, in its own areas of competence, which of course are quite limited, but in its own areas of competence, you know, health, uh, environment, uh, education, criminal justice, all the rest of it, that it, it basically <coughs> exercised sovereignty. That this was more like a federal constitution where, you know, the state governments, the the, if you like, the regional government has uh, its own constitutionally enshrined uh, right to legislate on these specific areas, and, and no other, no, these rights cannot be taken away. And that's what people felt, uh, or were led to believe, was what uh, putting Sewell on a statutory footing meant. Clearly, it did not. I then asked Ian what he thought this means for the State of the Union and the British political system in general. It's clear that the Brexit process hasn't just meant that the UK is leaving the European Union. It means there's going to be a new union afterwards, and it's going to be a much more of an incorporating union, a much tighter controlled union, and a much more centralised union. Um, I think before the whole Brexit process began, there was a sense, even in, among um, many in Westminster, that the UK was moving towards a kind of federal constitution, where there would be a division of powers. The Scottish Parliament and domestic legislation, at least, would you know, be its own boss. It would, it would decide what the laws were to be in Scotland about these areas, uh, these domestic areas, you know, uh, education, as I said, the law, um, criminal justice, the environment. Um, and that, you know, the, the, the bigger, the broader issues, maybe like currency, um, like defence, foreign affairs, would be managed on a UK basis. And there's plenty of models for that, obviously. You have in America, you have in Canada, you have states like Quebec, which have extraordinary latitude. You have uh, states in uh, America like Oregon, which you know, legalizes cannabis, has the power to set its own 
uh, statutory minimum wage. You know, so it's, uh, these are very significant powers. So there was a feeling that this is a kind of where we were moving, that, that almost by default, Britain was becoming a federal uh, entity. And um, I think really the, the Brexit process has ex exposed that. Uh, clearly, that is not, not the case. Uh, and the, the, the test of this was really the, the Sewell Convention, or whether or not um, the Scottish Parliament now had a right to uh, exercise sovereignty in the areas of its own responsibility, um, or did it not? Uh, you can't have two ways about this. Clearly, it, it does not. Now, it doesn't mean that, that Holyrood is useless. It can still pass lots of laws, but it will always be with the, under the understanding that these are endorsed by, explicitly endorsed by Westminster, and they can be taken away uh, whenever, whenever necessary. And that will be important coming down uh, the Brexit road when we get to the Great Repeal Act, Great Repeal Bill, which will supposedly uh, repatriate all the laws which are currently exercised by Brussels, um, uh, you know, agriculture and fisheries and what have you. Uh, these will go to Westminster initially. Um, there's a suggestion that Scotland will get more powers as a result of this process, but if it does, and I doubt it very much, they will be on the basis of you know, this provisional nature. But so long as they accord with you know, Westminster's view of things, then the Scottish Parliament will be allowed to exercise its power. As soon as there's a constitutional issue, a constitutional confrontation, it will be asserted the UK has uh, the overriding authority. I finished by asking Ian what he thought this means for the Scottish political system in general. Anything that you might say about... Well, it's, it looks like decision time, doesn't it, really? I mean, yeah. uh, I think uh, it's unfortunate because we've just had this referendum. Not many people really want another referendum so soon. And we've had two referendums in the last couple of years and some quite uh, energising, uh, stressful general elections as well. Um, but it's beginning to look as if this decision has to be taken before the UK leaves the European Union. Uh, if Scotland is going to retain the protections of European citizenship, remember that everyone in Scotland is currently a citizen of the EU, that confers all sorts of rights, the right of free movement across Europe, the right not to be discriminated against and grounds of your race or your nationality, the right to apply for any job anywhere in Europe, the right of residency in Europe. These are really quite important rights. Um, and, and Brussels has been the backstop, the guardian of a lot of uh, the environmental protections that we enjoy here. Um, now that's going to be taken away after Brexit. Uh, it's going to be a different union after Brexit. It's going to be very difficult for Scotland, I think, to thereafter leave the UK and then rejoin Europe. It's not impossible. and Nothing's impossible. And that's quite, you know, down the road in 10 or 20 years' time, that may well be what happens. But certainly to be on the safe side, if, if Scotland wants to stay in in Europe and retain the benefits of European citizenship, then Scotland has to at least be down the track for independence before Brexit, because that's the only circumstance under which the EU will be able to say, right, Scotland is staying in the EU uh, while, while Britain leaves it. More than that, I think uh, what we've also seen <clears throat> distressingly with the oh, kowtowing, the obsequious uh, attitude towards uh, the new president of the United States is that it won't just be Brexit UK that will be in, it'll be Trump UK because uh, uh, we are so desperate to uh, strike some kind of trade deal for whatever reason. It seems like a mystery why you'd give up a perfectly good free trade deal with Europe to go and try and have one with America, but that's what they intend to do. The kind of concessions that are going to be made uh, to Donald Trump in the process, I think most people here find profoundly distasteful have all sorts of implications for uh, standards of the integrity of the National Health Service, health and safety, uh, agriculture, GM crops, fracking, you name it. It's all going to be down, down there. And um, I think that's going to make people think very carefully about whether or not they want to continue down the road of a UK which is basically under the tutelage of Donald Trump. Thanks to Ian for taking the time to come and talk with me and I hope you found this short interview interesting. I would encourage everyone to go and read Ian's article at ianmcwerter.wordpress.com. You can find a link directly to the article below this video. Thanks for watching and I look forward to you joining us again soon. Independence Live is a group of citizen live stream journalists. People like you are us. We like
extreme important events which the mainstream media ignore. Indie Life has live streamed over 700 events since November 2013. Most past events are available to view for free from our website. To continue to raise the quality of our coverage, expand outreach, and develop much needed digital infrastructure, we need money. Please consider supporting the ongoing activity of Indie Life by making a donation at www.independencelife.net. <laughs>